I remember hearing someone tell me that if you want to see a miracle in the intensive care, because um, I get a lot of um, stories about things like that, they said if you want to see God really show up and start moving in the intensive care room because I was going to go meet someone, they said start praising him. Start worshiping and start praising him. And so I thought, wow, that's interesting. I've never heard anyone say that. But anyway, that kind of is a, a thought that is similar to the one I'm going to um, address tonight. And I'm going to first read Luke 17, 11 through 19. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And when he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, Were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, Rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So, that unfortunately happens over and over. Many of us have received great relief in our life when we chose to come to Christ. A lot of us were in pretty great distress at that time. And many will come to experience peace that they've never known when they come to Jesus Christ because you unload a whole lot of sin and baggage. However, there will be a great shift that will look much like this story when you leave the company of committed Christians for friendships that are focused more on the world. And inevitably that happens to a lot of people. They come into the kingdom they find excitement in God's people, and then they get bored, and then they start to drift back. And the majority of those who encounter Jesus will adjust to a new life, work towards restoring relationships, and the new blessings will become their priority. Jesus will cease to be their first love. And you will soon move away from showing gratitude to the one who did all, including giving his own life to allow us to have that peace and that favor. Our awe and our excitement about the blesser will not be part of what comes out of our mouth each day as he had hoped. We will not live a life filled with joy and excitement that he had planned for us. Therefore, we will not appear well for very long because we missed a major piece of what we should have gained in that healing that comes with salvation. Many forget to be thankful. You left healed in your body and your life but you did not leave well in your soul. You didn't choose the greatest healing that was available to you. Most of us have heard stories about the horrors of leprosy in biblical times. It truly was a very horrible disease of the day. And not only was there the pain of the disease itself, but there was also the stigma that went with having leprosy. The Mosaic law pronounced a leper as unclean. They were not fit to enter the tabernacle or later the temple to even worship. They could no longer live with their families, but the law required them to be moved outside of the city. The law required that they tear their clothes as a sign of extreme sorrow, that their faces had to be covered, and that they would cry out unclean whenever someone came close to them. Their faces were hidden, which represented that there was no form of intimacy that could be known about them. And in Hebrew tradition, the face was seen as being the most intimate part of a person. You could not truly know someone until you could see their face. That just brings up a lot of thoughts about today, doesn't it? Because we can't see people's faces. And it's very hard when you're already socially segregated and you do see people and you can't really see their faces. When the Jews were commanded to seek the face of God, they were commanded to seek his presence for the same Hebrew word for face. It is the same word for presence. To be a leper meant no intimacy with anyone, no friendship with anyone. You were isolated. You were a total outcast. 
Leprosy was regarded as a disease which, which the Jews supposed to be inflicted for a punishment of some kind of particular sin and to be more than other diseases, a mark of God's intense displeasure on your life. If you were a leper, you essentially lost everything. You lost your family, your job, all your money. You lost it all. Luke describes these lepers as standing afar off. The tradition said that they had to stand at least 100 paces away from anyone else. They could not even come close to Jesus. The Bible dictionary says of this disease, leprosy was the outward and visible sign of the innermost spiritual corruption. Small beginnings, but it had a gradual spread. It became an internal disfigurement. It was a dissolution little by little of the entire body of that which corrupts, degrades, and defiles a man's inner nature and renders him unmet to enter the presence of a pure and holy God. So I don't want to equate leprosy with sin, but there's a lot of common things between them. Like the leper, we too were isolated from true intimacy. We were outcasts from the kingdom of God. Like the leper, we too were in the process of losing everything to sin. And like the leper, we too were being destroyed by that which was in our bodies, the law of sin and death. And in verse 13, we're told as Jesus was about to enter into the city that these lepers who had to stand afar off began to cry, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. That was all that they could do. No physician could heal them. No medicine could cure them. They were simply helpless before the onslaught of this deadly disease. By all means, their life was over. It was actually... It was, it was a very bad way to end their life. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what you do deserve. And remember that mercy, not getting what you do deserve, these men realized that they were sinners and whatever they had re received, they felt that they deserved it. Yet now they're crying out for mercy, for relief from the torment of this disease. They're begging Jesus to have compassion on them to help them in their time of need and their only hope was placed on this one man Jesus Christ Everything had come down to this moment to this encounter with Jesus Jesus had compassion on them and he told them to go and present themselves to the priests as the law had commanded The priests would inspect them and give them a clean bill of health so they could rejoin their communities and their families they heard the word of Christ, they believed, and they were healed. That was by faith. They were not healed first and then told to go to the priests. They had to act on faith. What is significant is that out of the ten, there was one who reacted differently than all the rest. The Bible says that he saw that he was healed, he turned back, and he glorified God. And he came to Jesus and thanked him. There are three distinctions between him and all the others. Note that the perception of gratitude, the Bible says, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, the Bible says that he saw he was healed. Now the others, no doubt, also could see or knew that they were healed, but there was something very different that happened. This one, he took time to note that he had been blessed. He realized that something wonderful had happened to him. He was sensitive to the power of Jesus Christ working in his life and his perception had entirely changed. The devil will do his best to keep your mind off the blessings that God gives you. He will constantly tell you how bad you have it, of how everything is wrong in your life. He'll remind you that you've lost your family, that you don't have a driver's license, that you'll be on probation for the next 10 years. It's when you begin to realize how much you have in Christ that you will truly begin to be thankful and when you're thankful your heart will abound with love for the Lord that is so graciously given to you and that's the thing people come into it as a remedy for what's wrong with them and then they see they measure it by the what got fixed and what didn't get fixed and if everything didn't get fixed then they're gonna stay fixated on those things because that was the motivation for them coming to him anyway. God will accept that, but he does expect our focus to change once we meet Jesus. Mm -hmm. An unthankful Christian 
is a defeated Christian, for he or she will have no joy. This man fully intended to obey, obey what the Lord had told him to do, but he realized he had a higher calling that must come first. If you do not give God thanks, it will not be long until your obedience becomes a job that you must do. You lose the meaning of what God is wanting you to do and you become unthankful. It's fitting and proper to give thanks and praise to the Lord for what he has done in your life. Most of us that at least I'm around, we know we should be dead. We know we should be in hell. I mean, we lived lives that were, that made great clarity out of we should not be alive. But the same thing applies for the people that didn't live like us, who sit in church, who have a decent life. The same thing applies. They also need to give praise to the Lord for what he has done in their life. Every parent that does not have a child that has fallen into drug addiction or sin should be just thanking God every single day. There's so many things that we take for granted that we should be thankful for. If there's one sin that is most prevalent today, it is the sin of ingratitude. God does so much for us. Our indebtedness to him is enormous, yet we rarely or very infrequently offer thanks for what he has done. Part of that is we live in this country where everyone has been given entitlements to the point that we're drowning in it. We're vomiting out our mouth our entitlements. It's shocking when I used to work somewhere and we'd see how much food went into the dumpster every single meal. And then you'd be watching the commercials on TV of these tiny little kids with these big swollen bellies and yet nobody thinks about these things. They don't tie these things together. We take nearly every single thing in our country for granted. Very few Christians even offer thanks over their meals, much less offer thanks over what God does in their lives because we got food running. We have so much food in this country. There's free food offered everywhere, every day. For a child of God, thankfulness is not confined to a day or a season. It is an attitude that we must have every day and every hour. Medical research tells us that gratitude is one of the healthiest emotions that a person can express. And the more a person understands and responds to God's antidote for guilt that comes from living outside of God's will, the more he expresses a peace that comes from the Lord. So where are the other nine? Well, there's no doubt that they were declared clean by the priest and that they made their way back to their family and their friends. They got to hug and kiss their wife and their kids. They got to visit mom and dad, talk to their friends. Their minds were likely occupied on all the blessings that were now back in their life, but one. One loved his wife and his children just as much as the others. He wanted to hug and kiss his wife and children just as much as they did. One wanted to spend time with his friends just as much as the others. He hadn't seen them either. One wanted to enjoy the blessings just as much as the others, but one had his priorities in order. One did not get wrapped up so much in the blessings that he forgot the blesser. Mm. One put family, friends, and fellowship on hold so that he could worship the one that made his being with his family and friends even possible. It says, with a loud voice, he glorified God. With the same loudness and intensity, he cried for mercy. He now glorified God. And many times we cry loud for help, but we're really silent on the praise. Our lives are a mess. Oftentimes, people we know are in jail, losing loved ones because of our choices. And so many deals are made in jail for God, too. If you do this, I'll do this. We all hear them. We've all done them. But with the same zeal we sought help, we should be praising him when he comes to our rescue. And even if he doesn't get us out of jail, I tell many people, had he let you out of jail, you would probably be dead. He kept you there to save your life. But this man, he fell down on his face at the feet of Jesus, giving him thanks. He knew he was not worthy of this healing. He was not worthy to receive God's help. But by grace he was healed, and he comes to worship the one who unconditionally healed him. And he got more than the others did. 
they received physical healing from a distance, but this one not only got physical healing, but he got close to God and worshiped him as Lord and received spiritual healing. God may, may have chosen to physically heal a man from the distance, but spiritual healing comes when we fall on our face before Jesus Christ and worship him as Savior and Lord. His faith did not save him, but it connected him to the one who did save him. When I first became a Christian um, 30 years ago, a woman came up to me, and I was a brand new Christian, and I was elated that I had been healed because I had a sustained um, period of time of severe torment, just mental torment, very sick. I was very sick from my sin. But this woman came up to me because I was just, someone had had me speak or tell my story, which was pretty amazing. My testimony is very amazing. And she came up to me after I was done and she said, I have a big problem with your story, which scared me because I have had parts of my history prior to that where I didn't really tell the truth about things. So it was kind of like, did I just lie about something? But here's what she told me. She said, it was a close family member. I can't remember the exact relative, but she said um, her, this woman in her family had been found. She'd gotten really sick. She was a young woman. They just had a baby and she was getting really sick and they had her diagnosed eventually because they, they couldn't find what was wrong and she had been diagnosed HIV positive, which shocked the family. And they figured out that in the birth of their baby son that there had been some blood transfused and that blood was HIV positive and so she had gotten this disease from this blood. She said her husband, this woman who was sick now, her husband had was a pastor his father was a pastor and his father was a pastor it was like a four generation pastors and she said we knew god had allowed this so that he could miraculously heal her to build their ministry she said we knew it we all knew it we went they went around speaking they went around declaring healing um, there was just like a lot of attention drawn to this that god was going to Heal. They had the faith for this healing. There was no doubt in their minds that she was going to be healed. In fact, there was so such surety that she was going to be healed that they got pregnant with another baby when she was HIV positive, and the baby was born a little girl HIV positive, and the baby was very sick, and the baby ended up passing away very early within the first year which devastated them. They didn't understand this, but they still felt that this woman was gonna be healed. And so she said at certain points, they were just like, now they started to go to the people that claimed to have the healing gifts because they were like, why has it not happened yet? Why is it not manifested? And she said, and then eventually she died. She passed away. And this woman confessed to me how bitter she was to hear my story because she said, you deserved what you got. You lived a lifestyle that you deserve to be sick. She didn't deserve to be sick. And then God healed you, but he didn't heal her. She says, I guess I just don't understand it. And I was so caught off guard by that because I thought, should I be thankful? Or I, it just messed me up in the head. I thought, wow, I, I didn't even know what to say. I just told her I felt sorry, sick about what I had just heard but I didn't know how to respond to that because I felt like I, I realize I should not be healed. I realize I should be in hell. I am very certain that I should be in hell and I don't deserve to be healed. So in time, I have seen many things like that where people know I didn't deserve to be healed. I've never thought I deserved to be healed. I've never thought I deserved anything, to be honest. I have watched God grace after grace after grace after grace. I have not once thought I deserved it. Everything for me is a blessing because I know what I deserve. I know that everything God gives me is amazing grace.
I'm very, very blessed by God and I have no idea why. An attitude of gratitude creates contentment and we suffer from a disease in this country that's called affluenza. I've even seen this come up in a court case. I think some people probably know there was a national court case where th this kid, they felt the reason why he felt he wasn't guilty was because of affluenza. This is a virus of affluency and prosperity. And there's millions of examples to which we could point to that wealth, prosperity, and material things do not satisfy people. They do not satisfy people. They only create a desire for more. That is the impact. When you look at the movie stars and people who have great fame, you will see that. You will see how many of them end up addicted to alcohol and drugs. They have it all, yet they're empty. And they talk about this, all this emotional distress inside of them that they're trying to fill. Work, work, work. Just trying to fill this sadness. And there is a hunger they cannot satisfy and a thirst they cannot quench. In contrast to them, listen to the words of Paul as he described what his life was like. This is Paul talking. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10. Paul's life was filled with so many difficulties, which he could have easily complained about. How many of us would put up with the constant stress, confusion? He was always being beaten within a one beating of death, deep scars, permanent injuries, but he kept a very positive attitude. What Paul had learned was an important secret to life. He said in Philippians 4, 11 through 13, I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He had learned the secret of not living life based on the conditions around him. He could be content in prison as well as he could at home. And I've heard people, I've seen people get sentenced to long durations in prison and I've told them, boy, the mission field ahead of you is as good as it gets. Right. Just blow it up in there. I'll send you whatever you need. Paul's happiness was not based on his situations. It was based on his relationship with Jesus Christ and he knew that was all he needed. Everything he had was in him for it was Christ that gave him the strength for life. And God's saying to us, don't wait to be happy. Don't postpone happiness until your situation changes or you're not going to get anything. If you cannot be happy now, you're not going to be happy then. For happiness is not a matter of what you have or what situation you're in. It's a matter of who you are and how you respond to your life. It's found within and unless it is on the inside, all the things in the world on the outside are not going to make any difference. If you've been saying, I'll be happy when, then you're never going to be happy because when that condition is met, there's gonna be a dozen more conditions to take its place. And if you cannot learn to be happy now, you will never be happy in spite of how much you have or however much you achieve. And I have seen all levels of that. And I agree with that. They're just as miserable at the top. In fact, the people, one of the reasons why I love being where I am is because I like being where people are real and where people are happy. And I guarantee you, anytime I've had a big position, I was the most miserable I've ever been. If you're not content with less, you'll never be content with more. There are many who live in the world of if onlys, if only I had this, if only I were different, if only I could do that, if only this had not happened in my life. But God says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Notice it does not say prosperity with contentment is great gain. Contentment comes from seeking God, not things. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. I get to watch these women, and it's pretty exciting to see how well everyone does when we're doing prayer ministry. We all get, like, locked in. It's amazing that there's so many other things we could do, but that's something that we just flow all so well in and so naturally. What is it 
that makes people content, it all depends on how you look at life. Contentment comes when you learn that this world is not going to satisfy you. Nothing in it will. We're not even from this world. We're not going to stay here long. Satisfaction can only be found in a relationship with God and in living for Him. Um, Amber spoke earlier tonight and she said something that's so, it's so profound. We should just know it, that a believer a believer in Christ and a follower of Christ are two very, very different things. Satan is a believer in Christ. It is a relationship which provides us with meaning and security in this life and an assurance of eternal life where our deepest needs will be completely satisfied. Psalm 17, 15 says, I will see your face when I awake. I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. An attitude of gratitude generates joy. We are content, we are happy because we're a people of hope. We're a people of hope because we have a God who cares for us. He's made us, he's made our world, he has made today, he's made our tomorrows. And out of the gratitude we feel towards him for all this goodness and his faithfulness, we want to share those blessings. So if you are a grateful person, you are a joyful person. If you are not a joyful person, you are not a grateful person. You can look there first. Having an attitude of gratitude is an act of faith. It means you're unafraid to live and be happy because you have faith in God who cares for you and provides for you. He's faithful, his promises are true, and he never fails. And because you have a relationship with this wonderful God, you get contentment, joy, and a desire to pass on some of what God has blessed you with. To trust is to thank and it creates an attitude of gratitude. So a lot of if that's missing, again, falls back to unbelief. There's something seriously wrong in the foundation of your salvation. Dr. Jim Richards says, both the Bible and medical research have long acknowledged the link between health and emotions. Over the millennia, it has become accepted that certain emotions open not only our physical body, but our hearts and minds to new incredible powers of transformation. Almost every area of experience and research agree that gratitude is one of the healthiest, most beneficial emotions one can express. When gratitude exceeds a momentary emotion and becomes an attitude, it has the ability to transform every area of our life. There may be nothing that is so profoundly positive as the effect of gratitude on our life. And here are just a few benefits of gratitude that are documented. Gratitude affects our level of energy. Gratitude affects the level of generosity and kindness we show others. Gratitude repels the effects of unkindness from others. Gratitude boosts our immune system. Gratitude draws into our life the very things that we desire. Gratitude protects us from apathy and unbelief. Gratitude lets us know when we are in real faith. Gratitude causes us to find the best in life. The list could go on and on. But the foundation of gratitude will alter every aspect of your being. I want to end with this, and I don't know the author, but it's worth sharing. There are four things that are worse than death for a Christian. One, a wasted life. A life that's not lived is a life that is wasted. That might be worse than death. For much of my youth, I did waste it. I spent it on frivolous things that will all pass away someday. I pursued a life of wealth while ignoring a call to eternal life. Like the old Shakespearean phrase, better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all, which we can say like this, it is better to have lived and lost Someone is drawing a breath, God is not done with them. Someday God will demand an account from us for the life we have been freely given and what we did with it. Second thing, worse than death, denying Christ. This will be the worst of all. Jesus said that many are called, but few are chosen in Matthew 22, 14. And on the day of his visitation, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. We can deny Christ by our silence. Instead of obeying the great commission, which we are commanded to, Matthew 28, 19 to 20, we live out the great omission instead. 
for whoever is ashamed of me and of my words of him, the Son of Man will be ashamed of when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. This is far worse than a physical death because it involves a spiritual death. Third, wrong purpose in life. Even Christians can get caught up in the trappings of this world. There's a Judas in every human heart that seeks to have financial security and sometimes even at great cost. I don't think Judas knew they were going to crucify Jesus when he betrayed him because he later regretted what he had done and gave back the money. Jesus told Judas the purpose for which God created him, but Judas had his own purpose, which was to accumulate wealth. It backfired. It accumulated him. If only he knew that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And people will confuse that and say money is the root of all evil. The Bible does not say that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evils. And believe it or not, people in poverty can be completely torn up by the love of money. You don't have to be rich to have an idol of the love of money. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. 1 Timothy 6.10 Lastly, unredeemed time. It is very frustrating when you try to use coupons only to discover that they've expired. Then you wonder if you would have bought that item in the first place. God commands us, redeem the time because the days are evil in Ephesians 5.16. And James adds, you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. James 4.14 what will you do when you see Jesus for the first time? The Apostle John considers that when he wrote, Now little children abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. 1 John 2.28 Indicating that some are going to shrink back in shame, not so much for what they did, but what they should have done. They knew, they knew they were not following what they were supposed to not redeeming the time is wasting your life. We won't get a second chance when Jesus returns. There's a lot of news that's not on the news. There's ways to hear the news where you're not going to hear it on the regular news. But there's events going on right now that are, we're racing into eternity right now. People are just thinking, just like the Bible says, peace, peace, peace. They think that, but there is not peace right now. The Middle East is getting ready to explode. It started there and it's going to end there. If I did not know Jesus, I would be terrified. If I were not walking in the purpose that I was called to, I would be terrified. I personally would be terrified if I were waiting one more day, one more day to do anything right for Jesus or to get closer to Jesus. I would not gamble all of forever with I might get one more day out of this life what is so amazing here without him the most excitement we have is when we're operating inside of what God has us doing for him that's when it gets really exciting you're only going to get to do this once there's no plan b there's no purgatory you don't get to come back revisit this and do it right there's no reincarnation. God wrote the book. He's very clear. You get one shot at this. And he gave us all clarity on that right now. He says, whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. And to serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. A life spent not living is a life not lived. So I urge you to not stop until your heart, life, and mouth is filled and overflowing with praise. Not just tonight, but for the rest of your days. Never stop praising the one that has given us far more. Far more. Just being born in America, most people would give anything for that. I look at um, recently having conversations with someone who just hated their life, want to die every day, want to die every day. They're perfectly healthy, but they just want to die every day. And they resent that they have to live. And I thought about people like Steve Jobs, who 
would have given everything he owned for another day. How much a life is worth, how much one more day, one more hour, how many people would have had, wish they could have had one more minute to be able to call someone and say, I love you or I'm sorry. Time is the most precious commodity. Never stop sharing your hope in Jesus Christ because the only thing we're taking out of this world is people. That's the only thing that we can take with us. So I urge you to spend all of your efforts in some way to build the kingdom because in the end, those are the only things that are going to matter. Precious Lord, please help us. We're living in the most exciting days. The Apostle Paul said he would have loved to have been alive right now, but you chose us. I pray that we meet the expectation, that we step up to what was available to us in this time that others never got to see. Help us, God, to not take this for granted. Help us to not take you for granted. Help us to not take each other for granted. Help us to not take one minute for granted. Please help us. Please help us fix our eyes on Jesus and never look back. I ask this all in your precious name. Amen.